It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ryan Shard, who um, uh, works for Globus Labs as a computer scientist. He was previously a uh, Argonne's uh, Maria Gopert uh, Mayer Fellow, uh, and then became an assistant computer scientist with them. And he's, he's uh, had affiliations with Argonne U Chicago uh, and his uh, current company Globus. Uh, and he's primarily worked in this cyber infrastructure development space uh, to further enable and help folks in the scientific computing area enable their research. Uh, so he's going to um, tell us a bit about FunkX or this uh, function as a service using uh, uh, this federated uh, function as a service for scientific computing. So go ahead, Ryan. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks very much for uh, inviting me to come and give this chat. Uh, I'm really excited to give a talk on FunkX. I've actually been a little bit sick over the last few days and uh, was contemplating whether or not I should do this one, but I was really looking forward to giving another talk here. So uh, this has worked out well. So uh, yeah, yeah. So as uh, Jonathan was saying, I work quite closely with Globus Labs. I'm actually, uh, I'm a contractor back to the lab at the moment based in New Zealand. So I'm probably about 5,000 miles away from you guys, but uh, I continue working on projects with uh, Globus and Globus Labs in particular. So just for a little background there, uh, Globus Labs is sort of a research arm of Globus. So you're probably familiar with Globus, the uh, data management service that Ian Foster and uh, Rashner and Co lead. Uh, and yeah, Globus Labs sort of our mission is to research and develop different data management services to enable scientific computing. And then our work often feeds back into the, the Globus product line. So I've got two examples uh, in this talk today. One is uh, relating to FunkX. And then uh, a little bit later, I'll get to sort of how this fits into the Globus ecosystem and bring up uh, our pipelining tool, our, our sort of automation service called Globus Flows, which is another uh, effort that we've prototyped and then turned into a, a product at Globus. Uh, so just quickly, my, my role in the FunkX team is uh, essentially I built the initial prototypes of FunkX. So I'm pretty familiar with how it all uh, clips together. Uh, after sort of showing some examples of success with this and uh, plugging it into various scientific cases around Argon, uh, around the lab, uh, we managed to get an NSF grant, which um, allowed us to employ some developers to come and fix what I had built. Uh, so yeah, now we've got a fairly substantial team of people working on this, uh, bringing it together to a production service that can service uh, many thousands of users as where we're heading uh, and yeah, just meet the scale and load of our, our various use cases. So that's where I fit in. Uh, apparently space doesn't work. I've got a quick overview. Uh, I don't really like overviews, but I figured there was quite a bit going on in here. So just to give some context to what's going on, uh, I've got a, a quick back background introduction into sort of serverless computing and how that works. Uh, then introduce FunkX and how that sort of fits into all of us. Uh, I've got a live demo that I'll, I'll show you how we can work through this and you guys can follow along if you like. It's uh, hosted in Binder, so you can actually execute it all in your your web browser and it'll run through. Uh, we'll dive into some of the implementation details, which I'm more than happy to stop and field questions if people have uh, questions, if they're wondering how things clip together, I'm more than happy to go off on tangents and explain how it all uh, works. Uh, very brief evaluation, just showing that things run pretty quickly and then sort of uh, highlight how this fits into the Globus ecosystem with some example use cases and then the lessons learned. So without further ado, uh, we'll just jump straight into uh, how how all of this comes together. So I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with serverless computing and this concept that's really taken off in uh, the, the cloud space recently. I say recently, I think Lambda Functions came out about 2011, so 10 years ago. Uh, but this is just a, a model for providing compute capacity where the user doesn't need to understand the infrastructure or be responsible for <clears throat> managing any of the actual underlying resources. So they can simply focus on the, the actual application we're trying to deliver without having to worry about how things scale and that sort of thing behind the scenes. So there's two real benefits to this is one, you don't have to worry about the upside. You can save some money by not doing the upside. The cloud does that for you. And uh, the other side is uh, that uh, you can basically just, uh, 
oh man, I've completely blanked on where I was going just here. But it, it allows you to really just focus on the application. So you don't have to worry about all of this. There's huge cost savings aside, uh, alongside it. If your service isn't really running at any scale, if you're, you're, you it can essentially scale completely down to only charge you for what you're actually using. So function as a service is sort of a, a key player in the space. Uh, this is really a, a way of defining these lightweight computations or very small computations typically, uh, such as a, a Python function. Uh, you write this function code, which can just be a, a, a little Python function with a couple of supporting modules or something like that. Yeah, you register it with the cloud provider and then you run it on demand. So you don't care about provisioning the, the actual computers for this to execute on. You just write your function, register it, then run it. And you can run it at almost any scale. So uh, yeah, it's just a, a really nice, easy way to use compute capacity. Uh, the benefits of this are that it's typically extremely low latency, so you can support websites with this. Uh, it's completely on demand, so you run it whenever you want to run it, and the cloud will sort out uh, provisioning your, your infrastructure to actually execute it. And it will elastically scale, so you can run it once, you can run it a million times, the cloud will sort it out, uh, your jobs will come back uh, in a nice way. Uh, one of the side effects of this is you can actually combine these very small lightweight functions into a pretty complex pipeline. So this picture down in the bottom right is of uh, Netflix doing video encoding. Uh, or is it? Maybe, maybe this one isn't. Uh, this is just an example of showing uh, uh, files being manipulated by the, by the looks of it. Uh, but I know Netflix does use this for video encoding where they basically orchestrate a, a large number of uh, functions to, to execute these things as needed. So how does function as a service fit into the, the scientific world? So we sort of see three real advantages to it. One is that it provides a way to support this sort of new class of data intensive research if it wants to do on-demand compute. So we have a lot of users that generate a bunch of data with things like a scanning electron microscope or a synchrotron. And they really want to do this sort of event driven uh, or stream processing sort of model of data are created. We just want to analyze it at that time. So this fits really nicely into the, the function as a service model because you define your, your uh, data analysis tool, uh, you register it, and then as data are created, you run it. Uh, when you're not creating data, you're not paying for infrastructure, you're not worrying about it. And when you are, it's just there. Um, <clears throat> the second benefit to this is that we can facil facilitate the use of diverse compute resources. So with one abstraction, with one interface for the, the scientist, they can execute on their laptop or a, a local edge device or their laboratory cluster or a supercomputer. Uh, and from their perspective, it doesn't really matter where they're executing, it's just the same interface. And this really simplifies doing things like multi-site deployments as well, which is a, a, a huge benefit in some of these cases. And the third one here is that we can enable fluid uh, function execution across the heterogeneous computing continuum. So this is talking about from your lab, uh, your laptop or your laboratory cluster all the way through to supercomputers and clouds. Uh, we can place those jobs sort of as needed, right? So we can put them wherever it makes the most sense. And we've got this picture on the right here of an iceberg, which is really just trying to show sort of from the scientist's perspective, if we can provide this sort of serverless infrastructure, they only need to care about that, that top 10% of uh, what's actually going on. They, they just need to pick where their compute goes and provided it's like set up by someone, uh, they don't need to care about the infrastructure underneath it. They don't need to worry about provisioning nodes on a, on a supercomputer or making sure tasks are reliably delivered over to this or authenticated and uh, everything securely transferred. They just care about their simple interface to fire off a job and it gets done. So we already have a, a, quite a number of uh, examples of use cases that are that are moving in this granular direction, right? Like I've got a few examples here and I'm sure you guys can think of many others. Uh, just quickly looping through these. So the first one is uh, tabular file extraction. So this is a metadata extraction task. And as you can see with uh, these latencies, these tasks typically take less than a second. Uh, however, we want to apply them at an enormous scale. So essentially we want to apply them to all scientific literature or something like that. Uh, and it's just a, a fairly lightweight computation. We just need the, the tool to actually execute on a file. So it, it runs pretty quickly. So it's a, a nice way of sort of granularly defining these things. Uh, Tyler Skluzacek, uh, the student, the PhD student working on this stuff, uh, he's got about 10 of these different file extraction tools like uh, image extractor, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, he can 
define each of these as a function and then run them on demand as you need them. Another really compelling use case is with uh, machine learning inference tasks. So this is uh, MNIST digital prediction. Uh, again, it takes on the order of a second or two. Um, and again, it's something that you can spin up and down as you need it because you're probably not doing digit prediction constantly. Uh, these last three ones are actually uh, use cases from the advanced photon source at the lab, our synchrotron. Uh, the first one is dial stills processing. This is a, um, a serial crystallography experiment. It's uh, term determining the diffraction patterns from uh, uh, blasting protein crystals with uh, X-rays and then trying to work out the structure of different proteins. Uh, so that takes only a second or two to actually process these tools, uh, process these data. Uh, tomographic reconstruction, this is much more computationally intensive where we're now on the order of like five to 10 seconds. And then uh, X-ray correlation spectroscopy takes about a minute, which is a bit longer. Uh, and to keep up with sort of real time generation of these data, we need a few more nodes. It's, it's actually kind of funny because most of this time, this 55 seconds is actually spent loading the data, but I'm sure we can find some better optimizations there. So I'm sure you guys are probably fairly familiar with uh, the barriers to entry for high performance computing. So I've got a picture of Aurora here, which obviously has some pretty good barriers to entry, but all joking aside, uh, these supercomputers often have uh, a pretty big task for users to actually become familiar with them in such a way that they can use them as they need them. So uh, I, I'm mostly familiar with uh, the computers at the Leadership Computer Facility at Argonne, um, but these have various different queues associated with them. Um, they've got fairly coarse allocation models. So on Theta, for example, uh, you can only request nodes in 128 node batches. Uh, so they're not really designed for these short duration tasks at all, which is a bit of a shame because I mean, this computer capacity is there. We've got these users that need this enormous compute capacity because their instruments generate so much data, but they're not really uh, fit for this sort of model of uh, on-demand compute, uh, compute. Then there's also these other challenges, right? Of like, the, there's a learning curve to it, using any of these things, trying to understand how the schedule actually works, trying to understand how the module environment is working, uh, getting your tools compiled for these different infrastructures, trying to port them from one supercomputer to another is often tricky. So you've got to go and learn some containerization technology, probably Singularity or Shifter or whatever flavor the, the computing facility is actually using. Uh, basically, there's this impedance mismatch between short duration function workloads and existing research computing infrastructure, which we want to address with Funkex. We want to provide a way that users can leverage these computing resources in an on-demand manner without having to learn all of this stuff themselves. Uh, the other sort of side component of this is with uh, the end of Moore's law rapidly approaching, we really need to establish this entire continuum of computing resources and provide ways that you can flexibly or fluidly uh, compute across them. So you can deploy jobs to your edge devices or your laboratory machines or your HPC. Uh, really, we just want to compute wherever it makes the most sense, where, where there's resources available, where there's uh, idle compute there sitting there for you, where you've got allocations, where you have uh, your data, where, where any of this. Um, and the other thing is with this end of Moore's law, there's a growing reliance on sort of specialization. Right? Like there's these machine learning tasks perform a lot better on GPUs than they do CPUs. So suddenly you're needing to integrate these sort of specialized devices, whether they're uh, these sort of uh, like tensor processing units on the edge or um, just GPUs in your local cluster or a supercomputer. Uh, we need to actually provide a common interface to using all of them because we can't expect our scientists to go and learn how the latest and greatest uh, GPU is, is working for them. So, yeah. So I've got an example here. Uh, Jonathan was asking if we work with these guys. Uh, yeah, the answer is no. Uh, but this is a really cool example that Ian came across uh, and we, we use this just this motivational uh, uh, sort of demonstration of why this stuff is so important. So this is a group from Fermi Lab that do uh, top quark jet tagging and neutrino event classification based on a ResNet. And basically they, as neutrino events are uh, detected, they just want to do some form of analysis. So this tagging analysis takes roughly two seconds on a CPU, but takes about 30 milliseconds on an FPGA. So these guys are obviously based in Chicago at Fermilab. 
uh, and they didn't have an FPGA is my understanding. So they actually provisioned one at Amazon uh, using the Virginia data center, which is by speed of light sort of times about 10 milliseconds away. But because this thing is so much quicker, they can actually outsource their data and their computation to this FPGA and see a 40 times acceleration uh, to actually run this analysis at a, a different place. So this is just really highlighting the need for this ability to provide fluid computation. So just quickly, none of this is like terribly new. These motivations aren't new, right? Like we've been wanting to place compute where it should be, where the data is, where there's analysis time or software licenses or whatever for quite a while. Like Ian will happily sit there and tell me that uh, he's been doing this for 20 years with the grid or something like that. Uh, and this is obviously a, a key problem with a uh, key use case of the cloud as well. So why, I, why now? I think the, the real answer to this is that we've got this real opportunity at the moment with high speed, reliable networks now existing almost everywhere. Uh, we've got universal trust fabrics. So we've got things like Globus Auth that allow you to use your credentials, your university credentials to authenticate at uh, a different laboratory's computing resources and people trust that you are who you say you are. And we've got containers, which uh, this technology that really allow us to package up uh, an, an execution's runtime, all of their dependencies and modules and move that somewhere else. So it gives us this way to actually abstract where this thing is running or allow it to run in different places. So with all of that, I'm now at FunkX. So FunkX is our function serving ecosystem that we've been working on. Uh, basically it follows a similar model to things like Lambda where you would register your function with the, the service. And then the differences in the, in the Lambda world, you would then not know where that execution actually runs, right? Like you would uh, register your function and then invoke it and it runs somewhere in the AWS cloud. In our model, you register your function with the service and you then invoke that thing and specify an endpoint you want it to run on. So that endpoint could be uh, an endpoint you've deployed on your laptop. It could be an endpoint sitting on a, a supercomputer somewhere else. Uh, however, you've got the same interface from your perspective of register your function, invoke it with whatever payload and just specify if you want it to run at your laptop, you just put in your laptop's UUID. If you want it to run at the supercomputer, you put in the supercomputer's UUID. So these functions are register once, run anywhere at any time. It's our sort of goal. We really want to provide this sort of fire and forget, uh, sort of reliable, secure execution model where things will be buffered at the cloud. They'll be buffered at the endpoint. We'll make sure that that task actually gets executed. Um, we've got endpoints that are deployed on these remote resources. So they can really run on anywhere, any machine that supports Python. Uh, you can, would, and these endpoints will dynamically provision up resources as you need them. Uh, you can configure them to talk to different queues, et cetera, et cetera. And you can tell them to use containers. I've, I've got an asterisk somewhere around that. I can talk about uh, container management and FunkX a little bit more later, but uh, yeah, so you can tell these endpoints to use containers um, and then they will manage the execution of these functions inside those different containers. Uh, the FunkX service allows you to register endpoints. So when you start an endpoint, uh, you're forced to log in with Globus, uh, or log in using the Globus native auth client flow, uh, native app client flow, and that verifies who you are, your identity. Then when your endpoint connects, it registers itself, it passes along your tokens, and then it, uh, it securely associates that endpoint with you. So we can lock down who has access to that endpoint. Uh, we technically can share endpoints, so we can associate a Globus group with an endpoint. I mean, anybody in that Globus group can execute on that endpoint. However, we're a little bit concerned of the security implications of that, so we don't really publicly advertise that. Uh, it's more of a, you send us a message, we explain this is somewhat worrying, and then we'll turn it on for you. Uh, it's worked out pretty well in the past, so no concerns yet. Uh, the Funky service also lets you register, share, and run functions. So you can associate a Globus group with or with a function or set it to public. And then any other registered or, or any other user is able to go and invoke that function or if they're a mag group, et cetera. Uh, and then we can route functions to remote endpoints. So we provide the infrastructure to take your function code, your payload, uh, technically dependencies, and then route that down to the endpoint for execution. 
So how does this actually sorry, work? I'm sorry, sorry, Ryan, to interrupt. You said I could jump in with questions. Um, I was wondering yeah, when sure. this is running, um, is it running as the user, just like with the Globus transfers? Yeah, good question. So the way we do this in the current model is everything is uh, sort of single tenant. So it runs in the user space. So you as a user would connect to NERSC and then start your own endpoint. And that would be running under your user. So every execution would be run on your behalf. So it's really like the Globus Connect personal model where you can start a GCP endpoint. Uh, and that does not use root permissions, that just uses your user permissions. Uh, we do have a path toward providing multi-tenant endpoints that's on our roadmap. Uh, we're probably a year away from actually having that sort of deployed, which is why we support endpoint sharing at the moment. But our long-term goal is to facilitate multi-tenant endpoints where an administrator would set up a Funkex endpoint for the entirety of uh, say Theta or something like that uh, in a model similar to how Globus Connect server works, so GCS. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so just quickly going through this stuff. Uh, so basically you've got a couple of different machines. You've got your, I think that's the Cooley cluster at uh, ALCF, which supports singularity. And you've got a laptop or a, a Kubernetes cluster or something, maybe running Minikube on your, your laptop. Uh, you can start an endpoint there. I can show how this actually works. Uh, and then that will go off and register with the Funkex service as your endpoint. So again, it passes your tokens along, it gets registered with your user, uh, whatever account you, you're authenticated with, um, and then stored in Funkex. So we lock down access to that endpoint based on those credentials. The user then comes along and registers a function, plus dependencies. Again, I've got an asterisk there. Well, I don't actually have an asterisk, but I probably should. Uh, but yeah, they register some function. In this case, it's just uh, Funkex sum, which takes some arg items and returns some of them. Uh, that process will give you back a UUID for that function. And I actually skipped over that part, but when you register an endpoint, you get back a UUID of your endpoint as well, where UUID, UUIDs go everywhere in the system. Uh, so you've now got a UUID of your endpoint and a UUID for your function. And then you can come along through whatever client you're using, if it's a Jupyter environment or a Jupyter notebook or uh, some Python script. Uh, you say, I want to execute f of x on the payload 1234. Uh, you send that off to Funkex and you specify what endpoint you want it to execute on. And then that routes it down to the endpoint for execution. I mean, these endpoints will spin up resources if they're configured to do that or uh, execute locally in some Kubernetes environment and uh, pull the containers to actually execute those jobs and so on and so forth. So this is, so I don't know how familiar you guys are with uh, Parcel. So I'll just quickly give a one minute overview of what Parcel is. Uh, Parcel is a parallel scripting library uh, created at UChicago Argon. It actually builds on a tool called Swift. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Swift. That's been around for Mike Wilde for about 15 years. Uh, so Parcel is kind of like the Python implementation of Swift, uh, but really how we use uh, Parcel in this system is Parcel is essentially underpinning the entire endpoint. So when you submit a job to the Funkex endpoint, it uses Parcel to go and acquire compute nodes, which is using one of these configurations. Uh, so this, in, in this case, we're using a Slurm provider to acquire uh, five nodes at a time for 30 minutes. And when the node starts, it's going to use the FunkX endpoint, uh, FunkX uh, condo environment. And then it uses a pilot job model to uh, start a worker on each of those compute nodes that connect back to your endpoint that then pull jobs. So when you submit a, a function in for execution, one of these workers pulls it and then executes it locally on that compute node. Uh, so the way you start a FunkX endpoint is you pip install our FunkX software. Uh, that's actually a typo that should be funkx dash endpoint if you're starting an endpoint. Uh, you then do funkx endpoint configure, which will ask you to log in if you're not already logged in with uh, Globus on that system. And then you define some configuration. So we give you one default out of a box. If you create an endpoint, you're going to get a, a config there that's just going to use local threads. So it's only going to execute locally on the machine. You can overwrite that config with uh, any one of these configs that's provided. Uh, so we've got various examples. I'll just quickly jump over to that. Hopefully Alt-Tab works. So these are some of the examples. There's one for Filmutter uh, where we've got this high throughput executor that 
uh, you give it whatever machine address you want it to execute on, what provider you want it to use, and then some configuration information about like how long you want it to hold nodes, how many nodes you want it to acquire, uh, what queue you want it to use. So this is using a GPU partition. And we've got these for many different machines. So you can basically copy paste one of these and just modify it if you want it to acquire fewer blocks or if you want it to scale up to a hundred blocks instead of one block, uh, you just modify one of these to, to get it to do what you want it to do. Um, yeah, so basically that's, that's how this works. We've got many different examples uh, and you can deploy these endpoints on Kubernetes really quickly. We've got a Helm chart that will just spawn you an endpoint and tell you what its ID is, and then it will start working from there. So all of this coming together really gives us this, uh, this ability to code the computing continuum with FunkX. So I've got this example here of how this actually works. We can just quickly walk through that, where after you've pip installed FunkX in this case, because we're using the client SDK, uh, you can create a FunkX client. So this is just a, a wrapper or basically a communication layer over our REST API of our service running in the cloud. Um, you can then define a function. So you can see this is purely just a Python function that you specify, uh, makes it really easy to take existing functions and then register them. We've got our FXC, this is our client register function. You point it at the Python function you wanted to register. And then that gives you back a UUID for that thing actually, uh, so you can invoke it on demand. Uh, you then specify some payload. If you have payload, so in this case, we're taking a, an items field as part of that, or an items argument as part of that function. So we specify just a one argument payload. Uh, you then call fxc.run the payload, the endpoint ID, and the function ID. That gives you back a task UUID. There really are UUIDs everywhere. And then that'll give you back uh, some, some result pretty quickly. So the whole round trip time on all of this is. Uh, we, we're aiming for about 100 milliseconds. We've just added in some more uh, sort of task management stuff. So I assume we're about 120 milliseconds right now for a simple hello world back and forward. But that includes the polling time as well. And I can jump into it a little bit later with uh, how we, get, we have uh, sort of the async IO uh, web sockets layer as well to push those results back to you. Probably the only, or the, the coolest thing about all of this is how we're dealing with args and keyword args. You can have whatever function you want here. It can take NumPy lists, or NumPy arrays, uh, all sorts of different fields, different objects, different whatever. And you just specify them as <coughs> uh, input to your, your functions run command. And then we will pack that, we will serialize it with pickle uh, and pickle files will use del. Uh, and then we'll route that over to your endpoint, get the result back and then return it back out. So I see I'm already at half past the hour, so I'm not going to go through the demo of setting up the endpoint, but you can see just how this works. Uh, you pip install FunkX endpoint, you init to, to do the login, you configure an endpoint, then you start an endpoint and that'll give you a UUID running on your machine. You, you can do that right now. Uh, we also have this binder example. So if anybody wants to, play with this, uh, just need to move this thing. If you go to funkx.org, uh, I assume you can see my browser, and then scroll down, there's a try funkx button. So if you just click that, it'll launch a binder example uh, where this will all just run in the browser. So I'm just gonna quickly loop through some of this once our binder instance starts. Here we go, nice and quick. Uh, so as you can see, just going through the, the same code as we had before, we create our client, we click go, that's gonna ask me to log in because this is not running on my machine, which I'm already logged in on. This is running on uh, Binder's instance that it first provisioned for me. So I am not logged in on this machine. So I copy the code back, paste it in, and then uh, that'll create my client. Uh, we can now register a hello world function, which is nice. So you can see that'll give us back a UUID. Uh, we have a public tutorial endpoint that is accessible to anybody. So you can go on run whatever you like there. A uh, little bit dangerous. Please don't run too many bad things there. Uh, yeah, I don't know, we should probably do something about making that a bit more secure, but you can do whatever you like there. Uh, you can run whatever function, you just hit execute, that goes off, gives you a task ID, and then you grab the result back and it gives you that. So the nice thing is this, it's just pure Python, right? So you can import platform, return, spell platform.uname, re-register that, it gives you an ID, and then run it, 
and you'll get back versus running on our tutorial endpoint versus running on a Kubernetes cluster with, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you already saw that you can pass in args, keyword args, uh, that gives you back 15. You can see just how quickly this does actually run. So that was the run command and then immediately we call get status uh, or get result and that gives us back the result. Uh, you can put arbitrary dependencies in as you just saw where I uh, imported platforms. So provided these dependencies exist on the machine that it's executing in. So uh, you pip installed them over there. Uh, it will be able to use them. Your worker will be able to import them and actually execute them, uh, utilize them. Uh, you can do things like uh, popen or subprocess out various commands. So you, you've got a lot of control over how, uh, what you're actually executing over there. You can catch exceptions. So this is actually really nice. This is probably one of my favorite features where an exception generated by your worker is just returned to you as a typical exception. So we serialize it up, then return it back to you and you get your exception saying deterministic failure. And similarly, if you import gibberish, you'll get the exact same thing where it'll say this module was not found. And this is the exception raised by your worker on that uh, remote endpoint. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just sort of skip through this stuff. It's just running a, sort of a more intensive example. And then we've got this uh, asynchronous execution. So this stuff's really cool. This was only added maybe a few months ago where we've uh, stood up a, a web service, web socket service on the Funkix service. So you can now actually do uh, uh, asynchronous polling on this. So rather than in this model where you would execute your task and then you would uh, go and poll the result of that task, now you can actually set up a listener with this uh, asynchronous equals true feature on the Funkix client, and then just await tasks being pushed back to you, which is really nice. And then finally, we've got this uh, Python executor interface, which follows the uh, concurrent futures executor, where you can just call if you dot result, and it will sit there waiting until that result is pushed back to you. Uh, there's also things like batches and describing and discovering and uh, endpoint status. So you can actually grab what your endpoints up to, how many workers it's got, how many are idle, et cetera, et cetera, how much work is done. So, that's all I have for the demo. I'm gonna carry on in the interest of uh, having a chat about some of this stuff. Um, so how this works under the hood, basically there's three components that you just saw. There's the, the SDK slash client sort of side that uh, you register your functions with, you invoke your functions with. There's a web service, which is just a REST web service hosted in uh, EKS, so the Elastic Kubernetes cluster on AWS. Uh, this is, fully Globus auth. So every request or interaction with the web service has to have some sort of bearer token on it that we will verify who that user is. So every task invocation, task status, task uh, endpoint registration, et cetera, we check if you're allowed to be doing what you do. Uh, the other part of this web interface is that we've got a Redis store behind it. And now we use S3 to actually store some of these uh, this task information. So when you submit a task, we stick it into Redis. Uh, each endpoint has a queue inside our, our Redis store, and then they will pull off that queue and uh, transfer that down to the endpoint for execution. So this gives us one level of reliability in here. Uh, I was sort of telling Jonathan this earlier, we have one user, uh, Eric Jonas, who is uh, he's a professor at UChicago. He's a great guy. Uh, he's really hammered our platform. So we had a problem where he kept filling our Redis store with too much data because we were pumping results back into Redis to, for the user to collect them as well. Uh, so we've now added S3 support to store results out there just because uh, Eric was destroying our, our, our Redis store. So that's all right. And then there's this folder component, which is responsible for taking tasks off the endpoint's Redis queue and giving it to the endpoint. So yeah, I just said there were three components for the client SDK, the web service and the endpoint, right? So this endpoint is basically just a Python package that layers over the top of uh, parcel. So that's how we do all of our compute. Uh, and then there's this layer on top of that, which does all of the communication up with our web service. So we use a zero MQ to do low latency communication between our endpoint and the folders. Uh, this is all secured with Curves EMQ. So it's a, an encrypted channel where part of a registration gives you back a key. And then uh, 
it, the, oh, the other thing here is that we connect out from the endpoint to the Fortis. So this actually runs on basically any login node that you have internet access. You don't need to open ports on it to allow your endpoint to run. It'll connect out to our service to actually do the execution. Uh, I'm not terribly interested in the, the evaluation side of this. Uh, probably should be, but just, just a high level, so to highlight what's going on here. We, We've done tests on various machines and basically just shown that we can scale to many thousands of workers. Uh, we, we scale pretty well. So we've got 131,000 concurrent containers running on Cori, I believe. Uh, and we can push yeah, millions of tasks without too much issue. So this is just really a, a evaluation of how um, Parcel works. So. Uh, we do elastic scaling. So because we have such fine grained control over what that endpoint is doing, we can tell it to spin up nodes. We can tell it to destroy nodes as needed. If nodes are idle, you can control how long you want them to be idle for before the endpoint releases them. This works especially well on Kubernetes clusters because you can just spawn pods and delete pods as needed. Uh, but yeah, Funkis gives you this elastic scaling over whatever queue you want because we use this pilot job model. So it's not actually one function per endpoint. Uh, it's one function is executed by a worker that's persisting on that uh, that node. Sorry, I said endpoint before that node. Uh, we've got this multi-layered fault tolerance where our cloud service tracks tasks and our endpoints track tasks. So if your endpoint dies, we can recover from that. Your tasks will get executed. Uh, once your endpoint comes back online, it will start returning results that it hadn't already returned, or it will start uh, executing tasks that were queued up for it in the cloud. And then this is just sort of an interesting side of things where we can optimize performance. So this is uh, this graph on the left here. I know I'm going super fast with these graphs. I'm sorry if anybody was really interested in uh, looking at the pretty pictures, but just uh, just quickly this prefetching one. Uh, this is kind of this, uh, this cool feature that we can control on an endpoint by telling the workers how much work to pull at any given time. So really we'd, the aim of this is just to minimize the amount of communication between the worker and the endpoint itself. So if the tasks are very small, we can tell that worker to take a hundred jobs at once instead of one job at once. And then we can drastically uh, increase uh, the throughput of those, those nodes. Uh, this one on the right is just about batching. So obviously with Funky XP is a cost to submitting a task and getting a result because we send that task up to the cloud and all of its payload. And then we send that down to the endpoint and then the result goes vice versa. So we can batch tasks. We can send a thousand tasks in one request and then uh, yeah, basically just get rid of uh, a lot of the overhead of communicating with the service. Uh, this is just a, a fun research project that one of our master students, uh, Rohan, worked on. So this was kind of a, a way of using FunkX to do sort of smart scheduling over many different endpoints. So we talked about that sort of fluid computation across different resources. Uh, this one is we took a, a, a set of different machines from Raspberry Pis, desktops, cloud instances, GPUs, and I think a supercomputer in there. Uh, maybe not a supercomputer in this one, but and then uh, took some different uh, sorts of jobs, so matrix multiplication, map produce, file IO, and then just told it to run in different models. So round robin obviously distributes work pretty evenly. Uh, fastest endpoint just always uses the best endpoint for each job. And then this sort of cool one, this smallest ETA where Rohan's system, uh, it was called Delta, would learn how jobs execute on different machines and then make the decision of where to actually place that job based on what it's learned. So doing the smallest ETA, it would actually utilize these Raspberry Pis with very lightweight jobs, just so we can uh, reduce some of the load on the, the bigger machine to get a, a smaller uh, uh, full execution time on everything. Thanks, man, there we go. Okay, so that really sums up our what is FunkyX, how FunkyX works. I just wanted to quickly dive into sort of how this fits into the wider Globus ecosystem and how we use this to support scientific computing at, at um, in this case, the advanced photon source. So very quickly, I just wanted to shout out to this project called Gladia, which is a Globus architecture for data intensive experimental research. Um, it's a great backronym. I, I don't even know if we're going backwards with a made up word, but that's all right. Uh, so this project is really to sort of define a framework for how you would approach taking many different global services like transfer, 
or search flows, which is a newer service, uh, and actually build these pipelines to accomplish science. So if your instrument, your SEM is generating data, what sort of framework could you use to take all of those global services and actually accomplish that science in an automated, reliable, and fast way? So that's what Gladio is doing. Uh, and it's kind of nice because it, it highlights how FunkX plugs into all of these uh, different services and how with us using Globus Auth as this, uh, this layer on top of our entire web service, how we can just clip FunkX into any of these processing pipelines. So you're probably not familiar with uh, Globus Flows. This is a recently added beta service, beta service on uh, the, the Globus app. So if you go to globus.org, app.globus.org, you can go to slash flows and then you'll see your flows, which you probably have very few of them. Uh, just quickly, this is uh, it's a pipelining tool built on top of Amazon step functions. So what you can do is you can define these states using JSON. This is doing, a, a, it's a pipeline defined in JSON with multiple different states. You can do loops and all sorts of things uh, because it's built on the step function language. But this flow here is doing a transfer task, which uses the, the transfer service. Uh, and then it does a stills processing task. So this is a crystallography use case that does uh, uh, uses FunkX to do some analysis. So you can see how these things build into pretty uh, simple little pipelines where we can move data with uh, Globus Transfer and then analyze or act on that data with FunkX <clears throat> in these uh, reliable flows that you can run at pretty good scale. So some examples of doing this around the lab, I've got far too many examples, so I'm gonna basically skip them, but that's okay. Uh, so we've deployed this at the APS, uh, the Advanced Photon Source, Argon Synchrotron. Uh, so you can see from this picture on the right, Globus uh, Connect, so Globus uh, Transfer Service is widely adopted at the APS. It's at many of the different beamlines. FunkX less so, but we're slowly gonna take over. I'm excited. Uh, we've got FunkX endpoints on their local clo uh, processing cluster, or first. Uh, we've got them at LCRC, our, our laboratory computing research uh, center, and we've got them at the leadership computing facility as well. So this gives our, our researchers at the APS opportunities to build these flows that leverage any of these resources from APS clusters to their local cluster, uh, local servers through to ALCF resources as well. So very quickly, a couple of examples of how this actually works. We've defined those Globus flows pipelines for uh, a few different of these APS groups. So we work with them to define them. Uh, this is serial crystallography to solve protein structures for COVID. So we were doing this uh, last year. Was it last year? It must've been last year. Um, where we took COVID-19 structures, uh, put them in the APS and then kicked off this flow every time a, a new image was created. Uh, collected, we would start a flow that would do this analysis loop. So we would transfer the data to ALCF, we would do uh, analysis on those data, we would visualize them into these sort of crystal maps. I don't know if you can see that under this thing. Uh, then we would do analyzing of the results, which would refine the structures, publish them into a catalog, which you can see here, this tiny catalog that shows you sort of in real time or near real time, uh, while the experiment is running, uh, the results coming out of these machines, uh, which was really nice to guide, like, is this chip actually any decent or should we move on to the next sample of this? Has this one dried out already or whatever? And then we did occasionally uh, actually solve the structure from this using FunkX as well. This was a, a little bit more sort of uh, hands-on because the structure solving process is kind of involved, but yeah, we, we managed to get this entire closed loop and Darren, the beamline scientist was super happy with uh, how they went from weeks of analysis down to hours. Uh, X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy, this is another APS use case where we've defined this analysis pipeline that moves data as it's collected from the APS over to ALCF and then runs uh, the Eigen correlation tool and then plots results. So both of these tasks are done with FunkX. Uh, our flow uses FunkX to, to run this uh, correlation tool on the compute nodes and then plots results and publishes them uh, using uh, the login nodes because we need internet access to do the publication step. So we have two endpoints deployed on the um, on the FADA login node. One's talking to the queue and one's talking to just a local executor using threads to actually do the publication because we need that internet access. Um, and I skip these ones just because I wanna have a chance to chat. Uh, 
yeah, this, this is just a typography example where they ran 3000 flows, again, using FunkX extensively to do 2D and 3D reconstructions. And this is a neural network training pipeline that Zhengzhen uh, has worked on. So the goal of this is to train models using ALCF's uh, machine learning resources. Um, we've got dedicated Cerebrus machines and uh, that sort of thing to do machine learning training at scale. And then the plan here is to now put a FunkX endpoint on the edge device and actually do the inference again. So redeploy that model back to the edge and then do the inference as data are collected at the HEDM beam line. And then this is another HEDM uh, high energy X-ray diffraction microscopy use case. Uh, this one's actually really cool. So Hamant is a user at, a, he's a, a developer at two, at sector two. Uh, and he's built this MIDAS tool that does analysis. So he's built a, uh, some funky X functions to basically just use Midas at whatever machine he's at. So he's defined configurations to use Fader or Cooley or Polaris or uh, his Orpheus cluster. Uh, and then he kicks off a flow and at this invocation time of that flow, he specifies what Globus endpoint the data is getting transferred to and what funky X endpoint the execution should be sent to. So he can define at the input to the flow basically where this computes and he can control running it on ALCF or Polaris just by changing a field of use this config, use that config, et cetera. And the cool thing about this is he's now uh, going to his users and saying, if you want to run this at your home institute, just deploy a funky endpoint and everything else will get sorted out. We can send the data there, we can do the analysis there. Uh, so he's really excited about using FunkX as this way to get his users actually uh, doing analysis themselves, rather than his initial process, which was, let me help you install Midas on your machine. Uh, and we're trying to solve that with containers in this case. So, yeah. so wrapping up, uh, lessons learned. So basically our users really like that you can abstract the resources and run on their laptop or the supercomputer with the exact same interface. Uh, the simplicity of automatic scaling in this one interface is uh, really our big selling point. Uh, in addition with this sort of flexible web-based authentication model that they understand. So they don't need to like, really understand how these different machines are all uh, working under the hood. They, they just make sure they're authenticated, make sure they've got access and then they go from there. Uh, we found a great deal of success. Well, that's probably overselling things. We found good success with uh, event-based processing. So this is really our bread and butter for where people are using FunkX sort of in production uh, by defining these event-based processing pipelines and uh, Globus Flows pipelines that trigger as data are captured and do analysis on different machines. Uh, increases portability between sites. Sounds believable. Uh, resources can be used efficiently and opportunistically. So that's kind of cool. Uh, we've worked with ALCF to get ourselves a backfill queue uh, so we can spawn like one node or four nodes sort of on demand and we can fill the excess capacity with funky X task. And if there's a lot of idle resources here, we can spawn a, a ton of jobs just by pointing at that endpoint and it'll fill up the, the backlog of them. And this whole uh, being able to share functions, we've got a group at, uh, what was it, NCSA, but sharing access to a FPGA uh, through a, a shared FunkX endpoint and uh, shared functions. So the users don't actually need to know where that thing's running. They just give them an ID and they can go from there. However, it's not this sort of like amazing solution for everything. Uh, FAS definitely doesn't meet every scientific computing problem. Uh, if your job is like super dependent on data, uh, we don't yet have this uh, a really great model for how you get your data to different places. Uh, if your jobs are really like interwoven, like your, your functions are big MPI jobs, we sort of just step away and say, well, you can use FunkX to start your MPI jobs, but you're probably better off just using MPI to do all of that sort of inter-process communication. Uh, containerization is great until it isn't. Uh, we found problems where your container won't run on different machines just because we still need to use the, the system packages. Um, course allocation models are still a bit of a, a pain point just because these research computing resources aren't necessarily designed to work this way. And we're, we're trying to fix that, but we'll, we'll see how we go. And decomposing 30 year old Fortran applications isn't always easy. Uh, it's an expensive task, both for time and resources. Somebody needs to be employed to do that. Uh, so it's it's not a perfect match. So yeah, it's basically our lessons learned there. 
next steps are sort of, I mean, I've pointed this out a few times, but our containerization and management of runtimes is not yet like fully fledged. So we're working with uh, University of Wisconsin to build out a better container service uh, and then support in our endpoints to stage like singularity containers. Currently we can, we do the staging of uh, docking containers and that sort of thing because uh, Kubernetes will do that for you. So we don't really do it at all. Uh, but singularity, we need those containers to already exist on the machine. So you're sort of responsible for putting that runtime where you want that runtime. Uh, and our goal is to automate that process. Uh, S3 storage for task results that should be shipped. I think that gets released this week. So that'll be nice. Uh, AWS MQ, I didn't really go into how our communication layer works terribly well. We use EMQ, but it's sort of a pain point for both scaling and reliability. It's a, a bit of a beast that only a couple of us know how it actually works. So we've decided we're going to move towards Amazon's uh, message queue. So this is a rabbit MQ service and use that instead. Just, it just seems easier for moving forward. Multi-tenant endpoints are obviously somewhere we want to go. Uh, and then better integration with Globus Transfer and perhaps even GCS, like associating a funky endpoint with your GCS endpoint and then figuring out the paths from there would be really cool if we could uh, sort of get to that point. So that's it, that's my summary. Uh, FunkyX is a federated FAST system designed to meet the requirements of scientific computing. It enables fluid execution. It doesn't do it for you, but it, it does give you the tools to do this fluid execution and make decisions about where jobs are placed with a relatively simple interface. Uh, and it can be leveraged for reliable distributed uh, data management and pipelines and that sort of thing. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, you can check it out at funkyx.org. Um, you can play with our binder example there, uh, or there's a bunch of documentation on our read the docs. Uh, we also have a Slack channel. Uh, if you go to funkyx.org slash support, you'll see a join us on Slack button, which will give you an invite to join our Slack channel. And we're very active on there, always chatting. Uh, yeah, we'd be most welcome to having you join. Yeah, that's all I got. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ryan. So I I guess we'll kick off the questions with, um, since uh, Bjorn and I are, are hosting, I'll let Bjorn, since he asked in the chat, uh, ask the first question. And anybody else that has a question, just raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll go uh, according to um, uh, order. So Bjorn had asked if um, the, uh, you know, if you could compare this with Balsam's workflow tool, how does it, you know, compare and contrast? Yeah, it's a good question. So we work closely with uh, Misha and Tom, uh, well, Misha's now left, but we work closely with the Bolson team. We had a joint project with them to do uh, a different APSB miner, uh, powder, powder diffraction. Um, so the way we worked with it there was FunkX was sort of doing the communication over the sort of wider network and then invoking Bolson uh, at the edge, so at the computing resource. I know they're now working on uh, a layer to do this themselves, the, the sort of remote execution. Uh, so we're not terribly involved there. Uh, I think the, the main differences are that we plug entirely into the Globus ecosystem of Auth. They've got uh, their own authentication model built on top of LCF's uh, LDAP, is my understanding. Uh, and then, yeah, so we, yeah, I think they, their focus is more on the enabling large-scale analysis, and our focus is really on enabling many small-scale analysis tools, if that makes sense. So uh, I guess on, along that then um, uh, thought, train of thought, what, what is then uh, your uh, distinction as to what's the threshold for the size of the problem or the size of the number of calls that should be uh, used with FunkX as opposed to something else? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, I mean, we're trying to be open-minded about a lot of this stuff. So we've got some tasks that take a fraction of a second, 100 milliseconds to execute less. I know there's a case that does a very rapid uh, analysis of SEM images in like 30 milliseconds. Uh, we've also got use cases that run full day simulations of COVID through the, the um, environment uh, in Chicago. Uh, to be honest, we're, we're more focused on those smaller tasks. Like there's nothing stopping us from doing those longer tasks, but we're I think our, it's an easier model to support for us for those smaller tasks. So I would think anything running in less than like 10 minutes, 15 minutes is probably ideal for us. We do have use cases that run for longer. There's an alpha fold use case I'm working on at the moment that does about two hours of computation. Uh, 
but yeah, generally I'm mostly interested in those sort of shorter ones. Okay. Hey, I go ahead. Hey, great talk. I, I really enjoyed this. So um, I, I have two questions that are associated about uh, with the function registry. So one is, um, can uh, you use a function that someone else registered? Like if you were going to do a, like a model, uh, you know, machine learning model, you know, sharing across multiple people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the answer there is you can if they share it with you or make their function public. So when you try to invoke a function, we go through a, a series of tests. Are you the owner of this function? Uh, is the function public? Or are you in a group associated with this function if it's associated with that? If any one of those pass, you're allowed to run it. Uh, if none of them pass, then we reject you saying you don't have access to this function. Okay, and so I, I, uh, the other question is about that security of the registry because, our, so is it Globus or who is it that's saying like, I, you know, your functions are secure here and that we're going to make sure no one's like, you know, messing with your functions kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so I would say that side of things is outside of the Globus realm. So we use Globus as our, our authentication layer for uh, creating bearer tokens and passing those bearer tokens and ensuring those bearer tokens belong to uh, different users. The actual security of our system, uh, while we do run in a Globus account, the production FunkX service is deployed in a Globus AWS account. Uh, we're really just dependent on AWS as our security layer there. I mean, everything sits in a, a virtual private cloud. Uh, you can't access Reddit unless you're from one of the, the VPC ID uh, instances. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've basically just gone best practices on how AWS does security and try to follow that. So we work quite closely with the AWS uh, DOE team. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely provide us input on how we should be doing things and getting feedback that way. What about on the server side? Is there any, um, I mean, if you sh is, is it all just running as the user? And so if the user is sharing that with other users, are you effectively giving, um, is that, is this essentially a bypass? Yeah. That? Yeah, so I, I assume you mean the endpoint side where that does just run in user space as the user. So if I start an endpoint on ALCF Spada, uh, that is just my, uh, that's my endpoint. My executions happen on my behalf. If I then share that with somebody, which is why we're, we're sort of hand-waving about the ability to share, we don't, we don't publicly allow people to share endpoints. So you have to go through one of us to actually uh, use an admin to set that, that field. Uh, but yes, if you if I create an endpoint on Theta and set it to public, anybody would be able to access that endpoint, which is why we don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's just something. Right. Um, wait, I just want to follow up on that. So if a, if a user did set up an endpoint, uh, let's say at Nurse and then reached out to you guys about making it public, mm -hmm. would would you have any kind of policy where you would contact the site first before you would do that? So we haven't had this happen. Uh, we definitely okay. would. Well, yeah, we, we'd be very concerned about doing that for just a user of a system. Like we've, we've done this for uh, uh, an admin at uh, NCSA's Blue Waters machine where they wanted to make an endpoint public. And we spent a long time talking to them about this is scary. Uh, so we, mm -hmm. in, in the end, didn't make it public. We made it uh, accessible to a Globus group that they managed so they could uh, choose who was in that Globus group. And we went through that way, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That that would be, I think, a major concern here at Nurse. Yeah. Yeah. Happen. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. I mean, it's a major concern for me. Uh, yeah. I. That would be scary if we made that public. Yeah. So I wasn't following chat, but I see now uh, Suresh asked about the performance limits on data going through the service. So this is a, another really great question. Uh, so with our our Eric Jonas user, we got quite strict on the amount of data we were passing through the the web service. Uh, because we were running out of space in our Redis store, and which is why we've now switched to S3. Uh, I believe the latest limits are you can only push five megs as input for a batch of tasks, and the result of a single task can only be 500K. Uh, so we really encourage people to use transfer or something like that to move larger data. Uh, with our S3 backing, we'll probably bump the return result back up to a meg or two. Uh, just because 500k is pretty restrictive. Uh, yeah, definitely where we try to limit that for uh, obvious reasons. 
Okay, let's try to get to uh, everybody else that's had their hand up. So I, I don't know if Lisa, you had another question. I did have another question. Um, so you mentioned that you were running in sort of a, 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 a short queue in, in um, Argon, and we actually are kind of really interested in getting a preemptible queue uh, fully populated at NERSC. And so I'm, you know, I just wanted to, I don't want to put this, like we might be open to um, having those kind of workflows at NERSC. So I, I assumed you partnered like with, with users that were already on the system to set these things up? Is that, or do you have folks that are looking for more extremely short-term resources? Uh, so the way we accomplished that was we partnered with uh, Mike Papka, the director of ALCF, uh, saying we need a, a way to acquire 20 nodes as opposed to 128 because our APS mm -hmm. use cases, we were driven by uh, the XPCS use case, which uh, we use frequently uh, and the SSX, the crystallography use case, where we don't need 128 nodes to meet their sort of on-demand load, but those nodes are often there idle. Like if you check the status page on LCF, you'll see there's typically 50, 70 nodes sitting there. So uh, yeah, we talked to Mike about it. Mike agreed to give us a backfill queue. He already had a backfill queue for another group. Uh, so we just worked with that and then threw that in and it's, yeah, it's worked great. Okay, so we're, we're sort of on the other side where the site side, we have a we have a preemptible queue and we're having a little trouble getting some jobs in there. So I see, so I see. Ops and end, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Zenji, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a great talk and impressive work. So I had a uh, multiple questions, but let me start with the, my, my first one. I will just ask two questions. So one is, uh, I saw in your example, you showed one APS workflow kind of, there is like speed up and you said from several weeks down to like a few hours. I'm, I was interested in knowing where the speed up come from because my understanding is like, you are more like providing the convenience than kind of performance in my understanding. Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, so I kind of glossed over that. So the way they used to do analysis was at the 19 ID, the, the crystallography beamline, they had a server called BC Proc, which was a powerful wish server, it had 32 cores. They would run their experiment for an entire day, collect probably eight-ish, uh, or maybe, maybe 10 chips worth of data. So that's uh, on the order of half a million images. And then they wouldn't do any analysis during the actual beam time because they're busy doing their, uh, their, their beam time. They would check that like, as images went through, they'd check, yes, there were diffractions. We think that's good, uh, but they wouldn't actually do any analysis or reconstruction. So what we did was we came in and developed that pipeline with them using Globus Flows. Uh, and then we integrated FunkX to actually use ALCF. So their problem with BC Frock was they would collect all of their data and kick it off running, but that would take like, many, many days, if not weeks, to actually do the analysis because it was just one machine. So we scaled to hundreds of nodes on ALCF uh, and then that actually allowed them to run all the analysis during their beam time. So that's how we got Darren saying this used to take weeks and now it's taking hours because we could actually get results back to them as the experiment was going. I see. Well, thank you. Uh, another question. So let me uh, ask another one is I saw in your configuration for argon machine or per matter, you need to, I mean, the from user, they, they should have some uh, knowledge about, you know, how to use these systems, right? Yeah. yeah I was yeah. thinking, I mean, if I'm a per matter user, then I mean, it's about where you initiate the first, you know, the job kind of so what if I just start from Perlmutter and just run this whole thing like from Perlmutter? Do I need this funk X? Uh, so yeah, I think there's a couple of points here. One is, so you're right, but you need to have some understanding of the machine and the current model with uh, this sort of single tenant solution where the user has to start and configure their endpoint for use. The plan is to get multi-tenant where an administrator would do that sort of heavy lifting of set up the endpoint and then they would just be able to use it. Uh, in terms of running it from their local machine or running it like if you're logged into Perlmutter and then just want to execute, you're probably, I mean, if it, there would be some benefits to running it through FunkX purely that we would give you the reliability of making sure that task completes. So we give you sort of that fire and forget. You can send off your jobs and then come back the next day and get your results. Uh, but yeah, realistically, if it was me, I'd probably just submit the jobs. <laughs> uh, 
if I know how that machine works, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and I, I think we have one more then. Uh, so then you can go ahead and ask your question and we'll, we'll conclude. Okay, so Rain, uh, thanks for the talking. I just have one simple question. So when you program in that uh, register function, how can I deal with I'll say, if I have a file, I have one to deal with that and output to a file. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's purely just a Python function, right? So you can with open my file and start writing results as you want. Uh, it's just gonna be executed on that, that remote yeah. machine. The difference here is if you want to then return that result back to the client, uh, we start running into issues with how much data did you actually just write out to that file? Because it's too much, we will reject you sending that file actually as input or payload back through the service as part of that result. The way we often do this is we'll write a lot of results locally, like in the AlphaFold example, we'll write out the entire logs and all of that. And then we will simply return the location of that file. So the path name of that file, or perhaps a Globus uh, URL to that file uh, as a result of the function. So rather than sending the actual file contents, we just uh, return a pointer to that file. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, so the point is that the user actually needs to make sure that uh, when you write the code, your code and the, the app in the, your execution and your code, their data should be in the same endpoint, right? Yeah, yeah, so, so that's actually not, a, a... Say if I had write some, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of my functions that I would write, like the first does not take care of that. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Yeah, you're right. So a lot of the functions that I would write, if I'm running on one of those okay. machines, okay. the first line would be import os os dot change to, to wherever I want to actually be executing. Uh, by default, I think workers will start executing in your home directory. So if you just start writing okay. results, you're just going to end up in your home directory. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Ryan, for um, being so gracious to provide us a talk uh, this morning, this afternoon, or wherever it is, you know, where you're located. It's still morning, uh, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Okay. So Ryan's left his uh, contact information here, and as he suggested, join the, the uh, Slack group if you're interested in getting direct support from them. Uh, with that, thanks again, Ryan, uh, and uh, see everybody around. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Peace.